Well, good morning, everyone. This morning we are back in chapter 5 of the book of Matthew. We're going to be looking at verses 21 through to 48. And for those of you who are new to our church, there's a lot of new faces around, and that's great. Um, but if you've been coming for less than about 10 months, um, I'd like you to know that today's sermon in the book of Matthew is certainly not arbitrary. Um, we've been we've actually been going through the book of Matthew at a rate of about <clears throat> eight sermons per year since January 2020. And, and the reason we haven't done it this year is I just asked for a wee break as I was um, praying through a, a few things. But we're back in it now, and we have four slots available uh, this year. We're going to look at it, look at them at one Sunday a month. Um, but this is what we're going to be looking at. And I hope you can see that that there really are some exciting passages that we're going to deal with as we continue through Jesus's Sermon on the Mount. Right. Let's begin today's uh, um, passage. But before we do that, let's just take a second to pray. <clears throat> um, Heavenly Father, we we ask, Lord God, that you would just simply guide us this morning, that you would help me to speak. And um, just as importantly, that the people who are listening, oh, Lord, that you would let them hear. Um, your word is precious. Your word is living and active. And we just pray that you would challenge us this morning um, by whatever um, points that you need to impress upon our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning, as we deal with uh, the topic of the heart behind the work, um, I want to introduce this sermon with a question. And, and that question is, what is one of the great hindrances of our Christian walk? I suppose if we brainstorm that, we could come up with many different ideas. But I'm going to suggest that one of the biggest obstacles that we have in our Christian walk is an over familiarity with the gospel, being over familiar with the gospel. And that sounds hard to believe, right? I mean, but, but I think it's true. We hear about the gospel in, in podcasts and online sermons, home groups, and of course, here on a Sunday morning. And, and the gospel's amazing, isn't it? It's super, super amazing. But if you aren't really excited about it, maybe you've fallen into that category of being very over or too over familiar with the gospel. Have you ever thought about what you would do with, um, if you won 150 million pounds? I mean, we've all done it once in our lives, right? We've all, we've all thought about that. I know we're supposed to be these perfect Christians that live by faith alone, but we've all thought about what we would do with 150 million pounds. <clears throat> all the places that I would go, um, the fact that I would never have to cook a meal again, or between Leslie and I, never had, and, and Ella who helps a lot, would never have to iron a piece of clothing again. I mean, that would be amazing just in itself. But think about all the good we could do with that money as well. Um, build a church building in the back, boom, done. No need to fundraise for that, done. Send out hordes of missionaries to unreached people groups. And we think about all this as if, as if God needs our money to accomplish this. That aside. But we would also, you know, wake up probably really excited about every day about what we could do, you know. Feel like some New York pizza. I mean, never mind go to New York. We can't be bothered with that. Let's just send the jet to New York to, to, to pick up some pizza for us. Wow. And, and of course, I hope that we would have thought about all the good and all the people around us that we could help with that money. You see, the thing is, is that Christians inevitably go through the same thing. We're so excited uh, when we're saved at first. From, from time to time, we have spiritual highs and, and we feel like we'll walk a thousand miles to share the gospel with one lost soul. But the pleasures of this world and the troubles of this world push back against us. And it's not long before 
we can even feel like the Christian walk can be a burden. And then we feel guilty, don't we? You know, I, I haven't shared the gospel. Do I really have to go to church? I mean, come on, isn't there an argument that we don't actually have to go to church? Do we even have to go to home group or Bible study to pray? What if I didn't tithe this month? I mean, what if I didn't tithe this year? I mean, I could go on a fantastic holiday if I didn't tithe. And so on and so on, and it all becomes such a drag. I mean, we dare not admit that to anyone, perhaps not even to ourselves, but but really we get into this thing where Christianity becomes a bunch of do's and don'ts, and deep down inside you know you're not supposed to feel that way, which then produces more guilt and draws you even further from God. Uh, in shame. So, this morning I would like to remind us about the gospel, about the God that loves you. Because Christianity, remember, we know this, right? It's not a religion, it's a relationship with God. But as we start to think all this through, we, we find another problem. It's another problem we face is because the love of God is, is quite an unfathomable thing for our little minds to, to comprehend, isn't it? I mean, we know that God loves us. The Bible says so. And, and, um, and yet, when we say that we believe that outwardly, I susp suspect that many of us struggle with that uh, inwardly for reasons, many reasons, but some of which I've already shared. I mean, we know, we know how broken we are, um, we, how far we are from holiness. Um, and if you don't know, by the way, if you don't know, then, then, then you're either a new Christian, uh, not a Christian, or a Christian that does not read their Bible very much. We know how broken we are. And the Bible reveals a God of absolute perfection unfathomable ability to complete every act in perfection in absolute holiness and the more we understand who God is it becomes very difficult for us not to see ourselves in comparison to him by understanding more of God's perfection or or even purity uh, our impurity seems to be highlighted Matter of fact, and I think I've shared this before, but I've spoken to to, Christ, to, to people who, who say one of the reasons that they, they back off from God and they don't want to go to church is because they're, they're really haunted um, by the question of how could God ever accept me? He, and I know what I've done. He knows what I've done. You know, best, best to stand well clear of him. That's what they say. And yet... You know, as, as we are somewhat shocked at the great contrast between him and us, we read and we accept that he says that he loves us anyway. He loves us anyway. But we kind of accept it, right? We kind of accept it. Um, here's an example of what I'm trying to say. Have you ever... Uh, let God down in some big way and you feel lousy about yourself and you know you know that God's going to forgive the true repentant heart but you kind of still stay well clear of him and act rather sheepishly towards him uh, in prayer for a few days until you feel like the dust has settled down Has anyone done that have you done that it's just one of the many ways that we treat God like he was a fallen human like us. We expect him to be angry and uh, with us and for, for a while. And, and, and we think we ought to let him cool down for a few days. Oh, us of little faith to believe the scriptures. I love this parable in Luke. We're given a story about a brat and he doesn't wait uh, wants to wait for his father to die, so he goes and asks for his share of the inheritance now. Um, he takes the cash and he goes off to the big city where he squanders most of it on prostitution and alcohol and uh, probably much worse. 
But after spending it all, he, he, he ends up starving and desperate. So he gets a job uh, looking after pigs. And, and at some point in the day, he's looking at what these pigs are eating. And he goes, man, I wish I could eat that. He's that desperate. But then he comes to his senses. In Luke, I think it's chapter 15, he says, I will set out. This is what he says in verse 8. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father. I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. You see, at this point, he fully expected to go back and beg his father to make him like a janitor of some sorts around the family farm. Okay, He did not expect proper, full forgiveness. Because he knew that his sins were huge. But listen to this verse. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. See, God is the father who made you in your mother's womb, the Bible says. He was there for your first steps. He was <clears throat> there for your first words. He was there for your first day of school. He was there for all the bad times, the painful times, the struggles. He was there for your first day, first job, wedding day if you got married, birth of your children if you had any, and he was there in your retirement if you've gotten there already. You see, he's the perfect father, attentive and loving, who can turn even the darkest days into good days. And he's consistently holding his hand out to this broken world saying, you know, although you've rejected me, behold, I love that New Testament word, behold, like check this out, like, whoa, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Wow. And if you're not a Christian, you might ask, how is he able to do this? It doesn't seem fair that I should be forgiven. And it's not, it's not simple at all. It came at a great cost. And by the way, I just want to stop now and, you know, tap the table or something like that. If you are a Christian here, don't get over familiar with the gospel and switch off right now. Oh, I've heard this so many times. I can just wander and stare out the window. Please listen, Christian. Remember, in great love. God sent his son, Jesus, who lived a perfect life and was crucified on a tree. Something, and, 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 and then, excuse me, he, he took the punishment that was not his own. He stood punished in your place, taking the full wrath of God. Which, by the way, is something that the Bible doesn't explain in too much detail. Because I don't think a little mind could comprehend all that he went through. The crucifixion. I don't know if you've thought about this, but the crucifixion was the very, 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 very easy part. The wrath of God for the sin of the entire human race, much harder. Hundreds and hundreds of Christians have been crucified for their faith. Are we saying that they re that they earn salvation through through crucifixion? No way. No way. They did not take the full wrath of God. But now, victorious in his task, Jesus now offers peace with God to anyone he wishes. And he offers it to every single person, even you, the non-Christian or undecided listening to this video. Why? Why? Because he loves you. We've been repeating this over and over again. He loves you. Not in the general sense, but in the very personal sense. Like a perfect father. When we hold on to sin, when we hold on to that guilt, we, what we're really doing is forgetting all of this. And as Paul Washer says, that he, that he wished he could get it through Christians' thick skulls, that God loves us with no conditions. And that's the good news, guys. That's the good news, or, or other words known as the gospel. 
The Bible does not say you must try to live a holy life in order to be forgiven. No, it says that because you are forgiven, now try and live for the glory of God, who's already saved you and done all the work. As Christians, you know, we, we, we try. <laughs> we try hard. It's it's awkward. We, we stumble around a lot, uh, trying, falling, I think. Trying to shake off the sinful flesh is a bit like a cat who walked over a cellar tape. Um, you know, we're hopping around like mad trying to shake off this, this sin um, that will not be gone. It just won't be gone until we go home to the promised land and, and, and meet God face to face. That's a guarantee. But it's because of this good news, right? It's because of all this good news that we live for Jesus. In fact, Paul's letters in the New Testament are always helpful with that. He, he often explains salvation, explains the mystery of God's work uh, in Christ, secured for us by God. And then somewhere in the middle of his letter, uh, roughly, he, there's often a word, therefore, right? Therefore, because of that, because of salvation, because of what God's done, now live differently. Live differently. Because of that, now, I'm trying to get this through everyone's head, now live differently. Are you living differently? And if your heart is not holding on to the gospel, this incredible good news, the motive behind the work will often be wrong. Romans 12 is, is such a good example for that. And he says, therefore, because that, that's his therefore point in the book of Romans, eh? Verse 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, how, what, what? In view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. And yes, and yes, we do that like a cat who's walked over a cellar tape. It's hard. To pursue holiness. And that's okay. That's okay. The Lord is there. He understands. He's there to pick us up and dust us off. He understands. But now, you're probably, at some point, you're probably beginning to think, I thought John was preaching on Matthew. What on earth is he going on about here? Uh, this is an incredibly long introduction. You see, the, the passage that we're looking at today needs this context jesus was preaching this great uh, sermon on the mountainside he was preaching to a pe to the people of israel who had totally lost their way they had wandered away from god they used god's law to try and earn salvation they were trying to earn their way into heaven by bypassing god the father altogether they wanted the promised land they did not want a loving father. And with that heart that had no desire to know God, they turned the Old Testament into something cold and lifeless. And in this passage here today, Jesus uh, confronts this head on. He uses six Old Testament laws and brings them back to life with the gospel. Well, presuming we understand the gospel now, we've had five of them uh, read out. The plan is to have five of them read out in church today, so you're not going to get all of them read out. So I would encourage them to read, uh, for you to read them yourselves. But we will read the first one together. And by the way, um, in each of these, Jesus says, you've heard it said, you've heard it said. You you know, that's what the Pharisees are saying. But he follows them and says, but I tell you, but I tell you. Six times. Let's read the first one. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you're offering your gift on the altar and they remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before uh, there before the altar and go. 
First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Why did Jesus choose to talk about this law? Because the people of Israel looked at it and said, this is what they were saying, I can harbor hate for my brother. There was different categories there, right? I can harbor hate for my brother. I can take that hate, I can verbalize it, and I can say raka in some translations. It wasn't in, in the ESV, but it says raka in some which is transliterated from the Greek, um, which ultimately means you brainless idiot. I can verbalize that. I can even go one step further and say you fool. And by the way, that Greek word is where we get the word moron from. And that word, which I didn't realize this, means stupid, yes, and godless. I didn't realize the godless part. So what they're actually doing is passing judgment on someone else's spiritual state. Now, connecting this with the fact that murder is anger acted upon to the extreme they they think they they can do all that feel all that say all that and they believe that because they have not actually murdered someone that they are still righteous in the eyes of god and jesus says no way no way jesus says that a true follower of god of whom god has forgiven them all their sin remember that gospel would never act like that. If you if you're not over if, you, if you're over familiar with gospel, you will forget. If you're not over familiar with the gospel, you'll never act like that. Now, that's not to say that we won't struggle with these types of feelings. Uh, I know that I have um, when I felt hurt by others, but a Christian will not harbor these thoughts for long. And I love that word harbor uh, or nurture. It's all about protecting those evil feelings, right? A Christian will not harbor these thoughts for long. Instead, we, we should take this anger and hurt before God and say, Lord, you've forgiven me so much. Help me. And yes, it's sometimes desperate. Like, Lord, I just want to get a baseball bat and go over to that guy's house and teach him a lesson. Help me. Sometimes it's quite desperate. Help me, Lord, to forgive them like you've forgiven me. And like I said, if, if, you, if you think you can harbor and nurture these feelings for someone and be good with God, Jesus is saying, no way. No way. Forgive. Otherwise, otherwise, your prayer life, your peace with God will be severely accept, uh, uh, affected. And there is, there is just no way, no way you can hate and get down on your knees and pray in peace. Verses 23 to 25 make that very clear. And as a Christian, if you've, if you've found, if you've found some way to justify your dislike or anger towards someone else, you have become over familiar with the gospel. That saves a sinner like yourself. Never mind them, but look at yourself. What else did Jesus say? Like I said, these were read out at church this morning. Twenty. Tw the next one, Jesus said, you've heard it said that, that you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in, a, in, in his heart. Wow, powerful one, right? Do we actually think... That it is okay to lust over someone else other than your spouse. And God is okay with that because we just didn't physically act upon it? No way. No way. Can your spouse lust over someone? Are you happy for your spouse to lust over someone else? And you're going to be happy with it because, because they didn't act on it? No way. 
No, what is Jesus exposing here with the gospel, right? It's all about a committed heart, a committed, sincere, genuine heart. What was the next one that was read out? Well, we talked about divorce. Yeah, you can read that once again for yourself. But in Jesus' time, much, I guess, like our own, people were getting divorced because of any reason they could think of. Like, hey, my wife just doesn't make a decent loaf of bread. She's out of here. She's out of here. Believe it or not, I watched a documentary not too long ago, and that still happens in the Middle East as a reason. <clears throat> And yet Jesus says that marriage must be a reflection of Christ's attitude toward the church. A heart of commitment, of sacrifice, of endurance, of unconditional love, of forgiveness, of working hard at it, even how, regardless of how bad the bread tastes. It's about a united heart. It's all about the heart. What else did he talk about? He talked about oaths in 33 to 37. He said, Jesus said, you don't need to make an oath by some great name that you would never dare offend so that you actually stick by your word. He says, no, no, your yes should be yes and your no should be no. If your heart is right and sincere, you will do what you, you actually, believe it or not, you'll actually do what you said you would do. You don't need to hold yourself to account by swearing on some great name, if your heart is right. It's all about an honest heart. Jesus then talked about retaliation, you know, tooth for a tooth, an eye for a... In other words, my revenge will be justified. And Jesus turns around and basically says, stop using various old... Uh, 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 civil and uh, agricultural laws of the Old Testament to justify your hatred and need for revenge. Trust in the Lord. One day every human being will stand before him and give an account of themselves. God's going to sort it all out. Then, trust in the Lord to settle those matters. Don't harbor resentment and, and desire to see those... Um, that they've hurt you suffer why because if god treated you the same way whew, only hell would await instead trust in god's goodness and pray for their re repentant hearts so they can get god's mercy as much as you can it's about a peace loving heart it's not a bunch of do's and don'ts remember the gospel look what god's done for you now have a peaceful heart. Lastly, Jesus rebukes the Pharisees and says, you know, you'll, you'll love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Instead, Jesus says, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father <coughs> who is in heaven. And guys, doesn't this sum up the entire passage, really, that we've looked at? Isn't this not the entire point of what I've been trying to get across? Maybe I haven't done a great job of it, but, but verse 5, so that you will be sons or daughters of your Father who is in heaven. And please remember this in context too. Matthew is focused, the overall book of Matthew context, Matthew is focused on revealing the king and his kingdom in this, in this book, right? Is it all about outward appearances, this kingdom? No, no way. It's the opposite. It's about our individual hearts that come together and make a corporate heart that makes up the kingdom of God in this age. And I want to back that up by scripture just so that you hear it right, right? Luke 17, 20 and 21 says... Being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he, Jesus answered them. He said, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. Nor will they say, look, here it is, or there. For behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. It's about the heart. Now, I trust that you can already see that I could have easily broke this down into six sermons. But I was really fearful that we would have missed the entire point here. 
verses, um, let's just read the last few verses, and, and I think this will uh, highlight it a bit more. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do this the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Why? 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 Because you are loved. Why must you do all this? Why must you have? Why must you pursue this heart attitude? Because you are loved. You are forgiven. You are assured. You are kept safe, and you are given a seat at Jesus' table. Think about these things. Remember these things. Stop being over familiar with the gospel that saves a sinner like yourself. Stop giving the devil a foothold in your mind. Remember the king, what he's done for you, what he is preparing for you. Remember that you are ambassadors for, your, for the kingdom of God on this earth through your very own heart. <clears throat> And what do you do with that as you remember, as you remember the gospel, as you remember the implications on your life? You live differently. You live differently. Seek him in the word. Seek God in the word. Run to him in prayer. Fight off the sinful flesh. The reason that this was so shocking in Jesus' time is that everyone's heart was wrong was far from God. Let's hope that we're not the same. That we're willing to pursue love, peace, contentment, joy, kindness, self-control. And not harbor evil. Let's pray. Father, we, uh, we just thank you for your word. I just find it so, so challenging every single time. What is our heart really living for? Father, I pray that you would please, Lord, please challenge our hearts, but not just that we forget it in a couple of hours from time from now, uh, today, but Lord, that we would seek to live differently, to, to love for the glory of Jesus Christ, knowing that our hearts are a reflection of the kingdom of God. No wonder your name is blasphemed amongst the nations because of us. Lord, help us to live differently. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.